I had learned to do integrals by various methods shown in a book that my high school physics teacher Mr. Bader had given me. It showed how to differentiate parameters under the integral sign. It's a certain operation. It turns out that's not taught very much in the universities. They don't emphasize it. But I caught on how to use that method, and I used that damn tool again and again. Guys at MIT or Princeton had trouble doing an integral, then I'd come along and I'd try differentiating under the integral sign, and often it worked. So I got a great reputation for doing integrals, only because my box of tools was different from everybody else's, and they had tried all their tools on it before giving the problem to me. Feynman integration is a powerful technique in calculus, and today we're going to use it to take on this formidable integral. And it's full of pi. To begin the Feynman integration process, we start by choosing a function with a parameter. Here we're going to choose the parameter to be alpha. And we write the integral in terms of that new parameter. Our integral was already in terms of a parameter, so we'll use alpha here. Next we want to evaluate this function at some particular value that makes it easy to evaluate. So here we're going to choose alpha equals 1. So f of 1 is going to be the integral from 0 to pi of the natural log of 2 minus 2 cosine x. And splitting up the integrand using natural logarithm rules, we can separate them into two integrals. We'll call the second integral cursive i. So cursive i is going to be the integral from 0 to pi of the natural log of 1 minus cosine x. And we're going to use identity number one here, which is the half-angle formula for sine. Rewriting this formula by squaring both sides and multiplying by two, we can get two sine squared of half uh, theta is equal to one minus cosine theta. So we'll substitute that into our integral here for the cursive i. Again, using the properties of logarithms, we can split this into two integrals the first of which will be easy enough to calculate. The first integral will evaluate to pi natural log of 2, and we can pull the constant of 2 outside of that second integral. So now we have cursive i is pi natural log 2 plus 2 times a new integral, which we'll call curly i. So curly i is the integral from 0 to pi of the natural log of sine of half x dx. And we're going to let phi equal x over 2, so that we get 2 d phi equals dx. Curly i is then rewritten with new limits of integration. Here, they're going to change from 0 to pi to 0 to pi over 2, the natural log of sine of phi 2 d phi. And pulling that 2 outside, we get curly i is equal to the integral of 2 times 0 to pi over 2 of the natural log of sine of phi d phi. Because phi is really a dummy variable, we can rewrite this as 2 times the integral 0 to pi over 2 of the natural log of sine x dx. So that's curly i. And we can say that that integral from 0 to pi over 2, we can call that double curly i. And if we were to graph the integrand of this function, we will notice that it exhibits symmetry about the line pi over 2. So this would be the, this integral here would be half of the integral from 0 to pi.
Okay, great. So the next step would be then to look at a property that will be very useful. Here, let me write out double curly I here. Zero, two, pi over two, natural log of sine of x dx. And we'll use the property that an integral from zero to a of f of x dx is equal to the integral from zero to a of f of a minus x dx. And here a is going to be pi over two. And by doing that, the right-hand side of that equation might look familiar to you. Identity number two, co-functions. The sine of pi over two minus x is equal to the cosine of x. So with a quick substitution here, double curly i is equal to the integral from zero to pi over two of natural log of sine of x dx, which is also equal to the integral of natural log of cosine of x. And if we observe that adding these integrals to each other, i plus i is two i, and using one of those integrals as the natural log of sine of x, the other one with the cosine of x, we can start to put those two integrals together using the linearity of integrals and also the properties of natural logarithms. So we get natural log of sine x times cosine x is the integrand. Now, sine x cosine x is something we can also use the identity for a double angle. Sine of two alpha is equal to two sine alpha cosine alpha. And therefore, sine of two alpha over two is equal to sine alpha cosine alpha. With a little bit of substitution here, 2 curly i is equal to 0 to pi over 2 natural log of sine of 2x over 2 dx. We can, again, use the properties of natural logs to split this up into two integrals, the second of which will evaluate to the natural log of 2, uh, natural log of 2 times pi over 2. And that first integral right there, we can just use a substitution to clean that up. So the integral from zero to pi over two, we're going to make a substitution of w equals two x, and therefore one half dw is equal to dx. Pulling the constant of one half, changing the bounds of integration, and extracting out the fact that we now have the integral from zero to pi of natural log of sine of w dw. This is where that symmetry from before is going to come in handy. So that integral can now be replaced with twice the integral from zero to pi over two. The two and the one half in the front will cancel each other out. And then we can write two double curly i is equal to the integral from zero to pi over two of the natural log of sine of x dx minus that pi natural log of two over two. So double curly i is equal to negative pi over two times the natural log of two, which means that single curly i, which is double that, is just equal to negative pi natural log of two. That means that our cursive i is equal to pi natural log of two plus two curly i, which then would lead us to get that cursive i is negative pi natural log of two. And therefore, finally, f of one can be evaluated to be zero. Now it may have seemed like that that took a lot of work to get to f of one, but it's going to pay off here now. Here's where Richard Feynman steps in. We're now going to use the technique of differentiating under the integral sign. Differentiating with respect to alpha, the new parameter that we define the function to be. So here, we're going to partially differentiate the integrand with respect to alpha. That's going to give us the integral from zero to pi of one over one minus two alpha cosine x plus alpha squared multiplied by two alpha minus two cosine x dx. We can pull the constant of two out of the numerator there. So now doing a clever trick of multiplying both the numerator and denominator by alpha, pulling one over alpha out of that, but leaving the other alpha in the numerator there, we can rewrite this expression in a new clever way.
Next, we're going to do another algebraic trick that often works with rational functions, especially with trigonometric functions involved, and that is we're going to subtract and add one to the integrand. So obviously that'd be like adding zero to the integrand. But writing negative one as a fraction with a common denominator of the same fraction that we have in there, and equating the two fractions together, cleaning up the numerator, and rewriting our integrand there. It may look like there's a lot going on there, but it's gonna clean up nicely. What we get in the middle of all of this, the integrand comes out to be one minus one minus alpha squared over that denominator from before. And that allows us to, by the linearity of integrals, split this into two integrals once again. The first of which will be very easy to evaluate as pi over alpha. And we can pull that constant of one minus alpha squared outside the second integral to make the integrand simpler. So we're working on this f prime of alpha. And now we have this third integral here we'll call curly three. And here it's the integral from zero to pi of one over that denominator dx. Recall here that alpha is a parameter which is like a constant with respect to the integral differentiating parameter x. And so here, now what we're going to do is we're gonna pull out a constant of one plus alpha squared and rewrite that denominator there. So now we're gonna pull that one plus alpha squared outside of the integral as a constant. And now we have this new denominator, which is a little bit nicer to work with. Because now we're going to employ something that I covered in my last video, the Weierstrass substitution. We use the tangent of theta over two is equal to t. We get an expression for cosine one minus t squared over t squared plus one and a d theta, which is two over t squared plus one dt. And we make a couple of substitutions into that integral. The integration bounds will switch from zero to infinity. And rewriting the denominator there, notice that we would be multiplying by a t squared plus one from the d theta part. And multiplying through in the denominator there, we'll clean up that denominator altogether. And with a little bit of algebra, you'll see that the denominator comes out to be t squared plus one times alpha squared plus one minus two alpha times one minus t squared. And we're gonna do a little bit more to that and clean that up a little bit. So pulling the constants that we can outside of this integral from zero to infinity, we're left with dt over, and if you do a little bit more of algebra on the denominator there, you can, um, you know, f you can multiply through and collect better terms here, and you get alpha plus one squared t squared plus alpha minus one quantity squared. So now, f prime of alpha is equal to pi over alpha minus one over alpha. And we're gonna get a bunch of these factors with the alphas in the front. They're gonna cancel out at the end. So just bear with me here. And we're gonna work a little bit more on that denominator, cleaning it up a little bit there and uh, making it look a little bit nicer. Hopefully you can see that that second integral we're working towards making it look like an arctangent um, integral here. So we get for f prime of alpha, pi over alpha, minus two over alpha, one minus alpha squared over one minus alpha quantity squared, and that integral from zero to infinity. And now we're going to make another substitution. We're gonna let w be one plus alpha over one minus alpha times t. And uh, calculating the differential here, we also note that since alpha, the absolute value is greater than or equal to one, that'll let the parameter w run from zero to negative infinity. You can check that in the limit. So we get all of these constants of alpha to get pulled out. We have the integral from zero to negative infinity of dw over one plus w squared. And that integral is the famous arctangent integral. 
Now, just factoring out the, some of those alphas, and you'll see where all this stuff is, starts to cancel here. Boom, it all equals one. So f prime of alpha is equal to prime, uh, excuse me, pi over alpha minus two over alpha, the integral from zero to negative infinity, which evaluates at arc tan, and using fundamental theorem of calculus, that's going to evaluate to negative pi over two is the integral. And so the twos will cancel, we can combine like terms and we get two pi over alpha is equal to f prime of alpha. It's a lot of work to get a simple answer, but it's going to pay off now. Now, finding the antiderivative of f prime of alpha will be f of a plus a constant c. And because we evaluated f of one equal to zero, that allows us to know that the constant of integration is zero, leaving us with f of alpha is equal to two pi natural log of alpha. And finally, since f of alpha was in fact the integral that we had originally tried to solve for, our original integral i is equal to two pi times a natural log of the absolute value of the parameter alpha. Richard Feynman had a knack for integrals, and with a little practice, so can you.